All right, welcome folks. Welcome to Snorkel Science Talks. My name is Devang Sachdev. I'm a VP of Marketing at Snorkel AI. And uh, with Snorkel AI, we receive a lot of requests about um, one topic in particular, which is uh, how, do, how do data scientists and developers who aspire to be founders, where do they start? Uh, having spent some time at Twilio and working with developers who started in a garage and now have turned uh, their their ideas, their babies into large mega enterprises, whether it's about ride sharing or payments or more, I truly believe that the next generation of mega enterprises are going to be founded by data scientists and, and machine learning engineers. So this summer, we're, we've started a new series, a special series of, of snorkel science talks that focuses on entrepreneurship in data science. And it's my pleasure to invite Sam Mutamadi to uh, this episode of snorkel science talks. Uh, Sam is a partner at Greylock. He's focused on early stage and seed stage startups in uh, several different domains around AI, whether it's cybersecurity, uh, machine learning, or, or infrastructure and SaaS. Uh, his investments include companies like Abnormal Security um, uh, for, for email security, Cresta related to intelligent customer conversations, and then Snorkel, of course, uh, to improve the way that AI applications are built uh, and many others. Uh, so, Sam, welcome. Thanks, Devang, and it's a pleasure to be here. And I'm excited. Uh, I'm excited for this conversation. You bet. Uh, so, Sam, let's let's dive into it. Um, I, I understand that before joining Snor before joining Greylock, you had founded a company of your own called Guru Labs, that was a ML based fintech startup. Uh, would you would you tell our viewers about what was your journey into into founding this company? Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting. We're going to talk about the opportunity for um, AI entrepreneurship in this episode, but I've been working in this area for a very long time, actually predating Guru. So my first um, job in software was on the product side at a company called Relate IQ. And Relate IQ was started in the 2012-2013 time window with the goal of bringing intelligent software to CRM workflows. And so if you kind of rewind the clock, RudeIQ was the first company that went to customers and said, give us access to end employee email. And we will train models based on email behavior to automate and enhance sales workflows. So for example, if you're a sales rep, could we tell you what the probability that a given deal would close is based on sentiment and data in email traffic that you had with your buyer at the account? Or could we suggest to you when you show up at work, what the three most high value things or accounts for you to go focus on are based on our analysis of the different account behaviors as they progress through your pipeline. So that was where I first saw the power of bringing AI in an applied way to solving a specific use case. And that company ultimately went on to be acquired at, by Salesforce. And at Salesforce, we integrated AI across the product app, uh, portfolio also became kind of part of what's now called Einstein, which is which is Salesforce's platform for building AI products. Um, and then I left uh, and started Guru Labs, as you mentioned, which took a very similar approach to Relate IQ in that it the goal was to apply AI to some ubiquitous data set that perhaps had latent power for unlocking end user value. In this case, we focused on credit card data. So you know the core thesis there and and the product set was all about taking customer transactional data. Uh, both from end consumers and from point of sale systems, and then building pro buyer profiles in an automatic way using different ML techniques and recommending both net new products, merchants that consumers should go visit, and also enabling merchants to run dynamic pricing campaigns where they could show you and I different offers that are tailored to our specific purchasing behavior. And again, it was kind of reinforcing for me, completely different domain, completely different data set, but the power that applied AI can, can bring and kind of unlocking a new application. And then, you know, sequencing from there into the journey at Greylock over the last five years, I, you know, really the thrust of my investment falls into two buckets. One are companies that are going after existing software markets, be them SaaS markets, security markets, infrastructure markets, where we're using ML and data as a core part of the pro uh, product advantage to drive differentiated value. We talked about Abnormal, you talked about Cresta, Blend, others. And then the second is really infrastructure. And you know, with, with Snorkel front and center, 
where we're making it much easier for data scientists, ML engineers, business users at large enterprises to build these AI applications internally. And I think those two areas are my focus because I really think those are the two biggest waves happening in software right now and kind of the biggest opportunities for value creation. That's true. And, and in some sense, um, it feels like we are already in an advanced stage for AI. Uh, on one end, you know, IDC is predicting that the AI industry will be a half a trillion dollar industry just by 2024, three years away. Uh, but in many other ways, um, and, and you might have um, a similar experience working with enterprises, it feels like we're just getting started. Uh, and in some sense, it feels like the consumer technology, the large um, consumer technology giants have benefited from uh, putting AI to use pro with products that we use every day, whether it's uh, email clients or whether it's mobile experiences. But when it comes to delivering uh, business value through AI, things are still quite nascent. And um, I know that a lot of your focus is on enterprise technology and would love to understand a little bit about um, how do you see the state of the enterprise AI technology, where it is, and then what are the opportunities for enterprise AI specifically uh, if someone were to um, start a new company today? Yeah, so I'd start by kind of reaffirming what you said, which is in the fullness of time, the impact on, of AI in the enterprise is going to be massive. It's going to disrupt every business workflow across every vertical, right? And fundamentally, the reason why that's happening is you're seeing the convergence of a few important things. One is continued proliferation of data in the enterprise, that's machine generated data and human generated data, and that data holds predictive power. Um, you know, the second is continued uh, availability and decreasing costs around compute services. And, and then the third is obviously all the good advancements happening on the infrastructure side and on the alg algorithmic side. And those things coming together are going to unlock very, very big impact. You know, when I think about opportunities, I think of them ultimately in terms of delivery mechanism. So there are three ways I think enterprise AI gets delivered to customers and, and gets consumed by those, by those companies. The first is existing platforms and, and application companies will build additional AI features. The second is you'll see applied AI companies that emerge to provide a best in class end to end solution for specific problems. And the third is you'll see infrastructure platforms emerge and grow that enable these enterprises to stand up their own projects on their own in-house data you know, for their own unique use cases. So maybe I'll briefly comment on those three. So on the first, you will you are beginning to see an increased adoption uh, from platforms like Salesforce, Workday, ServiceNow, embedding AI into their workflows and making those more workflows more effective and efficient, right? For a company like ServiceNow, that might look like doing smart things around support ticket routing and resolution. For a company like Salesforce, it might include some of those features we were working on, you know, seven years ago at at really IQ, finally making their way into customer facing um, applications like predictive lead scoring and next best action. And so I would imagine that a lot of the product innovation we see from those platform companies is around AI, and they will be particularly well suited to solving problems where the data needed to train lives in the context of their environment, right? Mm -hmm. So if I'm doing lead scoring, and I'm, you know, Salesforce is exceptionally well positioned to do that if they have all the visibility through the engagement with that lead. Right. And so we probably stay away from companies that just want to build AI features on top of existing systems of records, because it's unclear to us why those are like long term durable opportunities for third parties versus, you know, what the opportunity being realized by the underlying platform itself. So that's the first. The second is, you know, these end to end AI applications. And we do a lot of investing here. Right. And and here the, the, the thesis is there are certain problem and customer problems where customers want to buy a solution from a third party vendor um, and they need that solution to be AI enabled, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think Abnormal Security is a good example here where Abnormal is building a next generation cloud email security platform and they leverage NLP and different AI techniques to, behave, to build behavioral models of employees at companies and what normal email behavior looks like and then look for anomalies relative to those behavioral profiles, right? And so the customer is fundamentally buying a security solution, they're buying an email security solution, but that solution is enabled by AI, right? Mm -hmm. Another good example that you, know, you referenced is Cresta, which is building a contact center AI platform. And one of the key use cases for Cresta is coaching agents that operate in contact centers in real time so that they can navigate customer conversations most optimally, whether that's to make a sale 
close the support issue or retain or upsell an existing customer, right? But in that case, their customer is buying a real-time coaching platform, but that real-time coaching platform is enabled by AI. And so, you know, we could walk through lines of businesses and also verticals, right? And, and, and yesterday I was talking to an entrepreneur who's leveraging computer vision on top of dental x-rays uh, to help insurers uh, more efficiently and effectively process dental claims, right? So again, the, 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 in that case, the customer wants to buy the end-to-end -end kind of claims processing solution. It's enabled by AI. So there, what we look for is problems that are sufficiently horizontal and shared by lots of companies, number one. And number two, we want to confirm that the customer wants to buy a vendor-based solution versus develop a solution in-house. And if those two boxes are checked, it's a great opportunity for applied, an applied AI company. I think we're still very early in, in, in that kind of wave of companies. I expect to see many, many more. And then the third is around infrastructure, right? And here it's all about how do we build the tooling and platforms to make it easier for these enterprises to stand up their own projects on top of their own data, right? And in many ways, some of the highest value use cases for MLAI need to be served by this third bucket because it's data that's specific to the enterprise. The enterprise doesn't want to ship that data out to a third party vendor. There's specifics to the way the model needs to be developed and the workflow around the model that are very bespoke. And so the, 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 the customer needs to partner with a platform and tooling provider that can help them you know, build that use case and get that use case to production. And, and I think you know, when we look at companies there, there are different dimensions we consider. Like one dimension is who's the end user you're building for. Right? Are you building for the business user? Are you building for the data scientist? Are you building for the machine learning engineer? And I think it's really important to have clarity around this. It's also important to understand like a lot of these workflows are very collaborative, right? And you actually have different end users coming in from different personas. And so how are you going to build to support this multi-party collaborative workflow is going to be a really important question that we're going to ask. Right. And then the second piece is where in the actual ML life cycle do you focus, right? And my observation, you know, and Devon, you mentioned, like, in some ways, it feels like AI is far along, in some ways, very early. And, and, and when you talk to customers who are earlier in their AI journey, I think the frustration they would voice is they're blocked on the data, right? And they have all these new vendors kind of coming in, pitching them on, you know, model management, model deployment, model monitoring, and they're excited about that. And that's important. But it's like, they're not even ready to get there yet, because they haven't made their data suitable for machine learning, right? Whether that's you know, labeling that data, transforming that data, managing it, unifying it. And so we're very attracted to companies that start at the beginning of the life cycle and recognize that that's where the pain is. Yeah. And then use that insertion point to kind of expand and serve more of the customer's needs as the customer themselves, you know, goes down the sophistication journey of, okay, now my data is suitable. Now I'm discovering and training models. I'm serving those models. Now I'm monitoring and governing those models. And, and that's why we're so excited about a company like Snorkel that really starts with the training data problem and then expands across the entire life cycle from there. Yeah, for sure. And, and we're, we're seeing a lot of signs of that from, from the interest that's coming towards Snorkel. Um, particularly, you know, one of the other things that oftentimes data scientists and machine learning engineers who are looking to solve enterprise problems, um, they, they look at, you know, which area when it comes to the data itself is uh, more valuable or more interesting to solve. Uh, so for example, with machine learning, there's been a lot of research done, done around vision. Uh, but at the same time, we know yeah. that vision related use cases within a traditional enterprise are limited. Not every company is gonna have an autonomous driving car, right? Uh, but there are some new and unique use cases for vision that we haven't even come across yet that would be solved using AI. When you think about you know, textual data or vision-based data or image-based data, or when you think about time series data, which is not necessarily unstructured or structured text, but rather just uh, free-flowing data from sensors or, or other time series sources, um, are there any particular opportunities that you see are, are more valuable than others um, in, in e either of these domains? Yeah. My perspective on that is I actually think there's valuable problems across all of these domains. Right. I mean, I think if, and I think your point is, is good, which is, um, you know, the computer vision problems in the enterprise, for, for example, may not be where most of the effort to date has been, you know, where it's been around a lot of robotics and, 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 and autonomy in, in particular. But on the other hand, you know, I, for example, I was talking to a, uh, to a large kind of uh, Fortune 500 company that 
uh, build security systems, right, for 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 enterprises, and they have a lot of camera telemetry, and they want to do a lot of interesting things on that data, whether that's counting people, looking for anomalous behavior. Um, and it's a perfect application for computer vision. It's a perfect application for an infrastructure provider to help support because again, it's very unique to their environment, right? Um, uh, you mentioned time series data. I mean, if you look in, in the manufacturing uh, and industrials verticals where you have these you know, massive factories with lots of sensors emitting tons of telemetry that's kind of consumed as a time series and wanting to, again, look for things like anomalies, do predictive maintenance, uh, there's lots of value there. And then of course, like if you look at text and just how much text there is in the enterprise, different types of documents, customer communications, the workflows that wanna be done there, lots of value. And so I don't, I actually don't think there's any shortage of, prob of, of meaningful and valuable problems to solve across these different data types. It's great. I mean, in some sense, it's, it's almost like uh, reminding the clock 20, 30 years ago to where just software in general was and then maybe even in 10 years exactly. ago where APIs were and now everything has an API uh, and soon enough maybe everything has a machine learning model embedded into it or, or pretty much um, close to it. Uh, but talking about you know, 2021, uh, it's, it's been a record-breaking year in terms of investments, especially in early stage companies. Uh, from what I've learned, the, the amount of investment dollars have doubled compared to the last year already and the number of com companies invested has increased by 60%. So, um, it's, it's quite interesting times to be an entrepreneur. It's also quite interesting times to uh, be, be an investor. But as an investor, what do you look, um, as far as characteristics go, from the team, from the business or the products uh, that you're investing into? Yeah, absolutely. And, and as you said, like the, the funding environment is exceptionally robust and, and, and that's very well merited just because we truly are in this golden era of software innovation, particular intelligence software innovation. And so I, I can tell you like in the last uh, five years that I've been at Greylock, never have we seen the quality and quantity of entrepreneurs coming through our virtual offices that we see today. And so there's a lot of conversation around things being overhyped. In some cases that's true, but there's also a lot of fundamental opportunity and we're gonna see a lot of interesting companies get built over the coming decade. Um, in terms of what we look for when we evaluate these companies, um, we evaluate companies on three primary dimensions, right, and for early stage. So one is, is, is the market, um, the second is the product, and the third is the team, right? So let me just, let me just kind of add on, on these things, right? So at Greylock, when we back companies, uh, we're backing companies with the ambition of building large, public, enduring businesses. And those are the types of companies we've backed in the past. And what we're working on uh, you know, going forward as well. And it's very difficult to build a large enduring business if you don't pick the right market, right? Mm -hmm. There are three types of markets that we back. Uh, the first is replacement. So exist an existing software market where there's an incumbent, there's maybe multiple incumbents, there's already purchasing behavior. You can look empirically and say, there's this much spend happening, but there's some fundamental technical shift happening that enables the new company to take on the incumbent, right? So, you know, if you think about Workday in the human capital management space, reimagining that space that was owned by people like PeopleSoft and Oracle and already had, you know, billions of dollars of, of revenue opportunity, but reimagining that for the cloud, uh, that's a perfect example of kind of existing market. Uh, the second is an emerging market, right? So here is when you're seeing some new customer behavior begin to grow and it's growing very rapidly and you build against that and you sort of exploit that market trend, right? So um, I actually think a lot of what's happening in ML infrastructure, one could call emerging market, right? Where you're seeing these enterprises finally begin to get their data ready for ML and then need to um, label that data and then need to train models and serve those models and govern those models. And so as that behavior emerges, you see companies emerging that are building against that trend and those trends are growing very, very quickly, right? And then the third is uh, new market creation. And here, you know, um, and often this happens on the consumer side of the business, you're, you're betting that you can get a new behavior to emerge, right? So you might introduce some new medium of interaction, some new type of software. Um, and, then, and then the hope is that that software actually unlocks a new behavior. On the enterprise side, we primarily wanna make bets in buckets one and two. So mm -hmm. either we want to believe that there's a very large market and we need to understand why what you're doing is fundamentally different than what the incumbent does. And if we can understand that, that's fantastic. Or we need to believe there's a 
important emerging market, not just that it's merging, but that 10 years from now, we're going to look back and say, wow, like that was one of the biggest trends of last decade. Right? Yeah. Um, and so that's the first box to check, right? And actually I tell you, most companies don't check that box, okay? But so so that's, that's kind of the first piece. Then the second piece is around the product, right? So what we're looking for around the product is um, we want to see, understand what's your roadmap to building 1.0 product. And why does 1.0 product not only differentiate relative to the competitors, but also drive sufficient customer value? Mm -hmm. This is another place we see companies fall into trouble, which is, you know, they build some very narrow wedge product and they find product market fit in that there are customers who want to buy them, but they can't actually extract enough in terms of contract value from those accounts where you can do the math and understand like, how can this business really build to a hundred million of ARR over five years, which is kind of what I think of as a best in class ramp. Yeah. And so we want to make sure that there's enough in the product and in the scope that's positioned against that market trend. If we have the market trend correct, that you can actually drive meaningful commercial value and you can build that business over time with a corresponding go to market motion to enough ARR scale. And that could look like an enterprise business where you know, maybe your ACBs are 250K, 500K, million dollars. You pair that with a traditional field motion. On the other end of the spectrum, that could look fully self-serve and viral and distribution. We have you know, much lower ACBs, but your appeal is much more horizontal. You can grow in a product led way. Both are fine, but like being in the middle is often dangerous. So it's understanding what the product is and then making sure that product pairs to a go-to-market motion that supports the value you're capturing. And then the last piece is the team, right? And I think here, you know, we look at a number of dimensions. I think the first is, you know, we want to back people who have an immense need to win, right? And who kind of wake up every single day with a burning passion for what they're doing and for making sure that they, that they drive what they do to success, right? And it's not just important because in, in, in the person, but that ends up being an infectious quality that informs the team they recruit, the investors they recruit, even their customers. Everyone signs up to go on this journey with them, right? So I think that's very important. We want to find people from the domain, right? who have a unique insight, why is this team uniquely positioned to execute on this plan, right? I mean, I think, you know, if you use the Snorkel team as an example, and just the background coming from Stanford, having built this project, having worked with a number of important collaborators, that really gave the team, team a unique mandate to go build Snorkel, the company. And so we're looking for that uniqueness. Um, we're looking for an ability to recruit and recruit the absolute best talent. So why is, why is you know, someone gonna leave and, you know, how are you gonna get the next Devong to join you to lead marketing, right? Um, that's a very important question for us. Uh, and then I think the last piece is we want a team that really is going to build for the long-term, right? And we invest for the long-term, we want teams that are gonna build for the long-term. And so really building the company, the culture, the product, so that's set up not just to, you know, be excellent and grow quickly in years one, two, three, but really to have a multi-decade story for what that company can become. And when we find a combination of those three things, market, product, and team, we get very excited. That happens only a handful of times every year. True, true. And um, I'll just tell you, this is, I'm just nearing my first year and even the journey at Snorkel has been incredibly exciting for those reasons that you pointed out, which is there's a great product market fit. The team is very well set up. Uh, and, and the challenges that we're uh, seeing, some are net new challenges that, that uh, this team or the industry hasn't seen before. And some of them are uh, playbooks that exist in the market and we just need to tailor them to our business. Uh, but you know, within this year, I've, I've also seen um, you know, several pitfalls and, and barriers um, that, that's taken us learning and experimentation to, to um, hurdle over. Um, you have a different vantage point. You, you work with several different teams uh, like Snorkel. Uh, I, I've heard a few pitfalls that you already mentioned uh, previously, but are there any specific things that you would convey to the viewers uh, to watch out for? Because at the end of the day, um, the opportunity is here and the, the quicker that they learn how to take advantage of that AI opportunity, the faster they'll be able to grow. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um... So let me start with some as it relates to like enterprise AI specifically, and then we can talk about some as it relates to kind of company building more generally. Um, I think the biggest problem I see with enterprise AI entrepreneurs is they're more focused on the technology and the solution than the customer problem, right? So, um, you know, I think it is very, very important 
to spend a lot of time before you write a line of code, really understanding what the customer problem is and what's the scope of solution you need to deliver to actually solve that problem, right? So on the infrastructure side, it's, hey, where in the life cycle is actually the pain in ML? Is it, is it downstream or is it upstream, right? On the application side, you know, is, is, you know, for example, should I just build something that analyzes sentiment of video calls or should I build that in the context of a workflow, whether that's a sales workflow, a recruiting workflow, et cetera. And if you actually start from the customer problem, I would bet what you often find is there's a lot to build that actually is not really AI and AI is just one component of the ultimate value delivery, right? So I think that's one thing uh, we see. The second is building a, a product and architecting it in a way that can operate in real world environments, right? So I'll give you two specific kind of uh, sub bullets here. One is training data. <clears throat> you know, if you're, if you're building a new um, uh, um, company and you're going after building an applied AI use case, how are you going to bootstrap uh, that product before you have enough training data to actually get your models to at a, a performance level that's acceptable, right? And so what, you know, what, I, what I see the best entrepreneurs do is, again, they take a very practical and pragmatic hat. They say, okay, I'm not gonna be able to do that on day one. And so instead, I'm going to start off by using some heuristics and more domain-based approaches that can get to some value, work with customers, then start getting the data after I've driven that value. And then over time, layer more and more ML in because I have enough data to actually make that ML effective. Very different approach than trying to convince a customer to give you all their data before you've shown them any value, right? So I think like, how do you actually bootstrap the product? And the second is, how do you handle mistakes, right? Um, if you're building a security tool that's AI driven and the tool makes a mistake, that's actually very impactful to the customer, right? Perhaps you just let an attacker in. Um, how do you handle that, right? And so with the best companies we see, they have these fail safes, right? So for example, it might be, you know, if I'm making a prediction, but I'm low confidence in that prediction, I have an interface where actually I federate out that prediction to an end user on the customer side and I ask that end user to review it before acting on it. Yeah very different than just relying on the system's accuracy, right? So I think like maybe thematically, it's like take a practical hat. You're not in a lab. You're not in some virtual setting. You're in a real world setting where the data is not perfect. You don't have it all on day one and making mistakes has real business impact. Build the product in a way that understands those nuances. I think those are some of the things that are like enterprise specific. Um, I think as it relates to more general company building, my biggest, most common mistake is the one I touched on, which is, building a product that doesn't have a go-to-market motion that can support it, right? So a product where the ACV is quite low, but it's not viral word of mouth spread bottoms up, right? Um, uh, and it needs a sales, uh, like a, a proper sales team inside or outside, and, and then it becomes expensive. But that's just such a big problem we see companies run into again and again. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'd say another, another like uh, the last kind of thing I'd say is um, not understanding the importance of repeatability from a product market fit perspective, right? Um, the goal is not to get five customers who love your product, it's to get thousands and thousands of customers who love your product. And what you need to do as a founder is you need to learn what are the most common use cases and patterns for one customer's purchase and how do you generalize that so that if you hire me you know, as a sales rep, I can actually go and understand who's the customer to focus on, what makes them qualified, what's the three use cases to target, and then how do I make them successful on one of those use cases? And <clears throat> some companies learn that very early on because they're focused on that in every customer interaction. It's not about just making that customer successful, but it's about taking back the learning that drives that repeatability. Some companies get to tens of customers and they still haven't figured that out. And they, the company looks like this and then it kind of completely asymptotes and you ask, why is that the case? And it's because you haven't built any systems that have nonlinear scale on them because you don't actually understand the repeatability in your business. Yeah. So figuring out repeatability early on is another really important piece. That's great. Um, and, and you know some of these things are, um, only learn through through actual experience. I mean, there isn't a book uh, or a movie or, or a talk that you can see this through and, and learn from it. So it's great that you're sharing this this with our viewers. Uh, talking about books, um, moving on to my last question for today, uh, is there a recent book or a show or a talk that you've enjoyed or inspired by? Uh, would love to would love to share that with our viewers. So. I have two answers for you. Um, on the book, uh, a book I, I recently reread um, and was reminded how much I, I like this book uh, is a book called Thinking in Bets by Annie Duke. Mm -hmm. um, Annie Duke is a former professional poker player, and she she's written, I think, now two books about how to make and operate uh, decisions in a probabilistic world. 
And I think her, her point is often we perceive decisions and outcomes as being deterministic because we only see the version that played out in our lives. But in fact, whenever we make a decision, we're buying some distribution of outcomes. Right. And the way we should make that decision and how we expose ourselves to that decision should actually be perceived by that distribution. And then when we review that decision, we should, if we want to assess the quality of it, we shouldn't just look at the outcome, but we should try to look back to why we made the decision, what the distribution was, and if we bought the right distribution in making that decision. It's a really useful framework, um, certainly in my world when I think about allocating capital, but I think actually, no matter what you're doing, that way of thinking about probabilistic decision-making and then evaluating to improve, uh, improve your work is really, really good. So I highly recommend the book. Um, on the talk front, I... Uh, it's a little bit of a plug, though I don't intend it to be a plug. I um, I think uh, I, I, I hosted a podcast recently on Greylock's uh, podcast series called Gray Matter on building practical AI products. And we brought together a couple leaders from applied AI companies. And we talked about some of those challenges that we were just, you know, we just talked about them at a very surface level. But um, I, I got to interview people who actually deal with these things and have navigated them very successfully. And I learned a lot on that podcast. So um. I recommend it to your viewers who are thinking about building applied AI companies. I think it's a, it's a really good show and uh, there's a lot of good insights in it. Excellent. Well, Sam, thank you so much for sharing this. And I'm sure that at least I have my weekend reading um, down for, for the book that you mentioned. Um, again, it was a pleasure to have you on the show and um, uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Devon. Pleasure to do it. Excellent.